Um, welcome everybody to another Diabetes Canada a healthcare provider webinar. My name is Grace Leader. Uh, I'm the manager of healthcare provider education, engagement, and professional membership with Diabetes Canada. And I'm very excited uh, for our speaker and our topic today, which is unpacking diabetes distress and depression with Dr. Krav Mehta. Um, Dr. Mehta is currently working as the medical director of psychiatry at South Lake Regional Health Center, Ontario, and he has a keen interest in mental health aspects of diabetes. He's the co-author of Diabetes Canada's guidelines uh, for the 2023 chapter on mental health, and he has multiple publications in peer-reviewed journals journals, as well as a chapter in the International Textbook of Diabetes. Previously, he served as the co-chair uh, for the Special Interest Group for Mental Health with Diabetes Canada and as the founder of the Diabetes Mental Health Clinic at South Lake, South Lake Regional Health Center. He's the advisor for the Mental Health and Diabetes Training Program um, for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation of Canada. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Mena. Thank you, Grace, for your kind introduction. And I'm here to talk about uh, the impact of diabetes and the mental health and uh, particularly about the concept of diabetes distress and how do we distinguish it from depression which is a psychiatric condition often seen in patients with or people with diabetes how do we screen for diabetes distress and diabetes separately and together and what are the treatments or the modalities or options available for people living with diabetes? Next one, please. So living with diabetes is not easy and the diagnosis and the management of diabetes can be a significant life stressor for individuals and their families. And it may be associated with challenges regarding illness acceptance as well as the participation in the treatment. Addressing concerns regarding the illness beliefs and the participation and treatment recommendations can be helpful. The lived experience of diabetes is often associated with struggles which are specific to the illness and can lead to significant concerns, specifically diabetes distress, the perpetuation of stigma, the reluctance to initiate insulin when recommended by the healthcare professionals, and the persistent fear of hypoglycemic episodes. It comes with a lot of fear, self-blame, and a huge stigma. All of this can negatively impact a person's mental health if the person has a diagnosis of diabetes. Next one, please. Diabetes distress is quite real. There are psychological reactions to the diagnosis of diabetes, which are perceptions about the seriousness of the disease, which may manifest by either discounting the seriousness of the diabetes, which is often seen in those with asymptomatic type 2 diabetes mellitus, or becoming overwhelmed by the diagnosis which is often seen in individuals and the families with type 1 diabetes mellitus. It could be not comprehending the extent to which diabetes can be managed, the degree of personal responsibility required for the management, and the perceived benefits and the barriers to taking action. Professional support to address these reactions can be helpful in promoting the self-management of diabetes. The stigma associated with diabetes is huge. There's weight-based stigma, the perception and the experience of being discriminated against due to one's body weight. It can be perpetuated by providers in healthcare settings. And when present, this may lead to worsening distress, diminished quality of life, as well as the decreased diabetes self-management behaviors. It is important that healthcare providers must be aware of their own biases and be able to communicate in a non-stigmatizing manner, non-judgmental manner about the weight-related issues and the management of the diabetes. Next one, please. Major depressive disorder can be seen similar to diabetes distress, but it can be more severe. It is a DSM-5 TR condition, which consists of biological symptoms, vegetative symptoms, and cognitive symptoms, which may manifest like sleep changes, 
appetite changes, energy level changes, feeling low in mood, feeling having more worry and anxiety, including agitation. Cognition issues like difficulty in remembering or concentrating. Depression can be associated with self-harming behavior or suicidal ideation. Next one, please. So what are the risk factors for developing depression? There are several risk factors which may put an individual with diabetes to have more depression, which may be female sex, age. So depression is seen more in adolescents and older adults. It is seen more in people with low socioeconomic status. People have low income, poor housing situation, low education level, and the lack of resources in the community and the society, lack of social support from the family, from the friends, from the employment, from other agencies, stressful life events, like uh, somebody has a job loss, unemployment, divorce, separation, a death in the family, fluctuation blood sugar control, despite somebody's efforts to do so and desire to have an optimum blood sugar control, especially the frequent lows in blood sugar, they can predispose to having depression. High level of hardship with living with the diabetes. Chronic nature of the illness, a person is having diabetes for a long time, they are at more risk of having depression as to somebody who has got recently diagnosed with it. And the complications which are secondary to diabetes, if somebody has a uh, greater degree and severity of the illness, the risk of developing depression is high. Next one, please. So how do we screen and diagnose an individual for diabetes distress? So it is important to work with that individual to identify the symptoms, the feelings, the emotions one has, Ask the concerns, ask what they want, what they're going through, and then discuss with their, them their options honestly. The screening tools available are the diabetes distress questionnaire for either type 1 diabetes mellitus or type 2 diabetes mellitus. So diabetes distress scale DDS for type 1 diabetes mellitus has 28 items. Whereas the DDS type 2 diabetes mellitus has 17 items and the revised scale for type 2 diabetes mellitus has core scale has 8 items. The sources have 21 items. And it's a self-report format using rating from 1 to 6 based on the feelings and experiences over the past one week. The features of uh, it on type 1 diabetes mellitus include powerlessness, management distress, eating distress, negative social perceptions, physician distress, and family and friends distress. In type 2 diabetes mellitus, the DDS includes symptoms of emotional burden, physician-related distress, regimen-related distress, interpersonal distress. In the revised scale, the symptoms include management demands, long-term healthcare concerns, hypoglycemia concerns, healthcare excess concerns, shame or stigma concerns, healthcare provider concerns, and the interpersonal demand concerns. Another scale which is validated to uh, screen for uh, diabetes distress is the PAID or the problem areas in diabetes questionnaire. There is depression and anxiety questionnaires which can be used to screen for uh, major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder respectively. The PHQ-9 is a nine item questionnaire which is used to screen for depression. It's a self-report scale using ratings from zero to three based on the feelings and experiences over the past two weeks. So vegetative symptoms such as sleep, appetite, and energy level changes, emotional symptoms such as low mood and the reduced enjoyment of usual activities, also known as anhedonia, behavioral symptoms such as agitation or slowing of movements, and cognitive symptoms such as poor memory or reduced concentration of feelings of guilt or thoughts of self-harm. Next one, please. 
so the treatments uh, are available uh, according to the degree and the severity of the illness and most importantly the diagnosis so the behavioral therapy which is uh, available in the form of motivational interviewing so this is a skill which is thought to be of quite value and very easy to do you weigh the pros and cons of each uh, treatment or each mod modality of treatment with the patient and develop their understanding of it. Cognitive behavioral therapy is uh, also called CBT or the uh, structured talking therapy, usually given in the form of six to 20 sessions. Each session can last around 45 minutes to one hour. And it is to change the person's thinking around their illness and the uh, understanding and the attitude towards it. Acceptance and commitment therapy is also thought to be of value as a strong treatment on, in the behavioral domain. The treatment may include medications such as antidepressants if somebody meets the criteria for major depressive disorder. Uh, the common medications we have person may want to try is the SSRI medication class or the SNRI medication class, antipsychotic medications, uh, which can be either typical or atypical, taken into consideration if the person is having uh, conditions such as schizophrenia. Anxiety medications or the anxiolytics can be tried if the person meets the criteria for anxiety disorder. Mood stabilizers can be tried if a person is having uh, condition called bipolar disorder, sedatives in case of sleep disorders, stimulants in a case of conditions such as ADHD, it may be helpful. Next one, please. So the bottom line is that as healthcare professional, we should expect the individual living with diabetes to have feelings and emotions about diabetes because it is it comes with a package and feeling emotional and uh, having uh, feelings about the illness itself is totally accepted and it should be expected in a person. We should help the person to recognize when it is more than diabetes distress. So we should be able to clearly define when the person is having diabetes distress or when a person is having major depressive disorder. It is prudent to screen the person with diabetes on a regular basis using the validated scales we have so that we don't miss the condition. And subsequently work with the individual to find the strategies and the tools that will work for them individually and respectively. Next one, please. I shall pass it over to Grace. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Mehta. That was very um, informative. I think we also, uh, in in uh, addition to your webinar, we have uh, a great uh, webinar on um, disordered eating. If you haven't checked that one out, um, that's available now. And then also, I think in relation to this one um, about sort of the the duty of care in terms of uh, when you or the continuity of care. Sorry, when you um, maybe need to refer someone out, but that person will still be your your client in terms of. Um, uh, managing their diabetes. So very excited about those other two webinars in our series. Um, you can watch all of our other webinars and any of our past webinars at guidelines.diabetes.ca slash webinars. They're all available to view there. And there's also a link to our podcast. Uh, please fill out the survey uh, in the in the YouTube uh, links um, to help us improve our webinars in the future. And you should consider becoming a Diabetes Canada professional member. Um, you get a discount to our professional conference, access to our online community, uh, mailed uh, and online issues of the Canadian Journal of Diabetes and online issues of the Diabetes Communicator, and a whole lot more. So you can do that at diabetes.ca slash membership. And uh, we encourage professional members to continue the conversation at community.diabetes.ca. You can log into your account and then access the online portal and continue having um, discussions about um, uh, mental health and diabetes. Um, if you enjoyed today's presentation, it's obviously freely available for healthcare providers. Consider making a donation at www.diabetes.ca slash donate to help us uh, continue to make more content like this. And um, I want to thank Dr. Mehta for uh, today's presentation. Um, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next time.